Hello, welcome to Lazada Insider, featuring knowledge that makes a difference. We share trusted insights, forward-looking perspectives, and exclusive expert interviews to keep you ahead of the curve. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Lazada Insider Consumer Insights Series. I'm your host, Katrina, Senior Manager from Lazada Group Strategy. The retail landscape in Southeast Asia has been evolving at lightning speed in the recent few years, and we saw different retail models flourishing like never before. But given this increasingly complex and ever-changing retail ecosystem, how can business adapt and thrive and access wider markets and also reach more consumers? We're going to have a very good discussion on this topic today with expert guest Melanie, Director of Market Strategy and Understanding from Ipsos in Singapore. Welcome, Melanie. It's great to have you on Lazada Insider. Good morning, Katrina. Many thanks for having me here as well. Uh, I'm Melanie from Ipsos, and I lead one of the teams in Ipsos Singapore called Market Strategy and Understanding. Uh, we're in the business of helping clients see where the market is heading, identify the best growth opportunities, and also anticipate and harness dis uh, disruptions, which is what we have been seeing a lot in the last two years. Um, well, specifically in the shopper space, we help optimize shopper strategy. We make the most of omnichannel touch points and also test their activations. Excellent intro. Well, we have seen that the landscape in commerce has become increasingly vibrant in recent years. Tell us a bit more. What has changed in terms of the types of commerce? Yes, indeed. I, I think the landscape has really, really changed a lot. Uh, perhaps let's begin with our global reality. Uh, you have probably read zillions of articles on how COVID-19 has driven a huge acceleration in e-commerce. In a global survey that we have conducted last month, we see 73% of the world's consumers claiming that they're shopping online. Now, where we are living here in Singapore, this number is probably not too surprising. Okay, but if you think about it, you know, as a global uh, uh, finding, it is still quite a stunning one and obviously one that we continue to expect growth. So in today's context, brands can sell in more online locations than ever before, including third party websites and social platforms. Now, in addition, even when retailers opens up, we continue to see the growth in hybrid shopping. Using tech to plan our trips in store, checking prices online while walking in the aisles, or maybe ordering online to be picked up in store. These are very, very common scene these days. Now, the new world that is technology enabled and fully disrupted has really led us to a scene where digital commerce channel is proliferating, it is also fragmenting as well. So as a result of that, we have seen different types of commerce surfacing to, aside from e-com, amcom, there is vcom, AR, VR, D2C, which is direct to consumers, on demand, or sometimes we call it quick commerce, uh, social com, live streaming, and so on. Okay. So for the past six months purchase incidents, eh, just think about last uh, six months purchase incidents, using some of these newer commerces, our global numbers is showing that this is nearly half of the traditional e-commerce types. So we certainly is seeing a strong uptake. You know, it will get stronger as we as we pass, and uh, particularly stronger in some of the bigger markets such as China, uh, India, Mexico, and Brazil. Now, Southeast Asia will catch up, but perhaps a little bit slower than some of the bigger markets. And if you think about all of these options for shopping and marketing channels, our new reality is what you've mentioned. It's indeed very vibrant, but also very fluid as well. So how do you foresee this dynamic that you described will be like in the next three to five years? Um, well, I, I, I think uh, in the next three to five years, things are just going to go with where we are seeing the new uh, types of commerce is surfacing right now, but just going a little bit more in depth into trying out some of the commerces. Some commerces may uh, strive better than others. Uh, it's something that we should uh, watch out for. 
So a lot of changes to come. This is just the beginning of a journey. <laughs> So you mentioned about the coexistence of different types of commerce. So this complexity of the coexistence of mm -hmm. you know this vibrant kind of commerce scene actually leads to a new retail concept that Ipsos actually described in a recent paper. And the term is called convergent commerce. What exactly is convergent commerce? Now, there are many names to this, right? Some people call it commerce anywhere. Uh, new retail, future retail, smart retail, or maybe even retail 2.0. And we call it convergent commerce. But essentially, convergent commerce means we're seeing the blurring of channels and touch points. Okay. Now, at the same time as purchase channels and touch points are increasing, digital and physical environments are also converging. So they used to be different, right? Point of sale, be it online or offline, used to be just about closing the sale. It is not the case anymore. But think about uh, maybe using QR code in store to look at pricing, promotion, product information, uh, recipe ingredients, and so on. Now think about maybe people shopping at home, at work, or in store using VR and really getting into the game. Now this is really where retailers and platform players are increasingly investing very heavily now to create more gamification to help keep shoppers really engaged when they're not in store okay now then there is also the story of showroom yeah okay one of the transition that is happening it's many of them are not even selling the products anymore so, for example, Apple no longer sells the laptops and phone in the U.S. in the store anymore, right? You go in, you shop, you look, you pick the size, the colors that you want, and they will direct you to the computer to input your order yourself. And then the items get shipped to your house. Okay, so it's becoming totally acceptable that the store becomes perhaps a micro warehouse or a fulfillment center, shifting from selling to fulfillment of digital orders. Now then also think about social media, right? In the past, it is primarily used for consumer awareness, uh, engagement, maybe a bit of education. But with social commerce, they are becoming shoppable channels as well. So buy now buttons in social media, for instance, you know, they allow you to see and buy just one click. Now this means that in many cases, uh, there is now actually no actual pre-purchase shopper journey per se. Right? The traditional stages of shopper journeys where you start with plan, you search, you evaluate and you buy. Now, some of these, you know, in many instances have already been severely altered. Okay. So you may ask, uh, so what's the difference between converging commas uh, versus what we have always been referring to as omni-channel? Now, the concept of omni-channel will still stay. It still applies. And, and omnichannel is really about similar customer experience across touch points. You know, all, it, 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 it is still a concept that will apply. Uh, it is within the context of simultaneously converge and fragmented channels and environments and touch points that we're now seeing the changes. And hence, we call this convergent commerce. And you mentioned uh, quite a lot about the technology part. Uh, I mm -hmm. want to talk a bit more about that, like AR and VR you mentioned. Um, I think yeah. in more um, new forms of commerce, this technology plays a more and more critical role. And even so, for more established digital commerce platforms, can you give us a few exciting examples in this space? Sure. Okay. So AR and VR, um, it's, it's not new. Uh, it didn't come about just because of COVID, but obviously it's been accelerated by storefronts being closed during the pandemic. So the role of uh, augmented reality, we call it AR, virtual reality, or even you call it mixed reality, MR, has really increased for product trials. Um, in one of the recent survey that we had, uh, you know, we saw about 40%, and this is a US number, by the way, it's 40% have already had or maybe they're using some kind of a virtual app to try on beauty products, apparels, furnitures, and home improvement items. So people are getting on to try it, okay? And, and this type of digital try-on experience, it's likely to become more common in bricks and mortar environments too. So for example, uh, one of the e-commerce tech giants, 
uh, has recently opened a hair salon, which offers AR consultation for customers to actually try on virtual hair colors. Um, and most of you would know that beauty companies are probably the first to be doing that. Uh, they've done the same and quite a few of them, the global brands, have actually uh, set up exclusive uh, flagship stores just doing that. So imagine as you enter the store, um, all sorts of things can happen, you know, and this is really up to a lot of the uh, innovations coming from uh, the retailers. You know, let's say you're guided um, via wearables or maybe a voice comes through to you, to the items that you want. Uh, maybe when you pick up or pull the items from the shell, uh, maybe other information could pop up as well. So the list of possible examples kind of goes on. And especially in the field of gamification, um, you know, that's where, uh, again, innovation and creative ideas can can come in. Now, personally, I've seen, like, for example, treadmills um, that, you know, people who sell treadmills, they, they kind of mimic the whole experience of running on turf uh, or maybe certain test area that's being set up in your store fr uh, front to kind of resemble, uh, let's say, a weather conditions if you're selling winter coats or maybe a hiking situation if you're selling a hiking equipment. You know, so all of these can now be made possible at the storefront. And, and this is all in line with the consumer shift towards wanting to experience more. I mean, when we talk about new forms of retail, right, typically people talk about, you know, digital space, a lot of things are happening. Um, so in general, what does this mean actually for the role of physical and offline stores? Yeah, uh, this is something that really has been discussed a lot, in, especially in the last one to two years. Um, the fact that global sales and digital channels are forecasted to overtake physical in the next couple of years, um, it's really indeed adding a real transformation to physical stores. Uh, we've seen warehouses and dark stores yeah, um, you know, coming out uh, progressively. Uh, we've also witnessed the shrinking of physical retail network footprints. So as shopper behavior changes, retailers will really need to rethink store layout and maybe the space allocation as well. Now, if you're operating in uh, a category uh, such as those where physical product demonstration and trial is less important, uh, you would kind of have to expect that physical stores may become the minority purchase channel moving forward, you know, but rather maybe a major fulfillment channel. Now, this means that retailers will need to uh, reimagine what and where a physical store actually is. Uh, many of the physical stores will ultimately become one of the two things, convenience and efficiency on one hand or exper experiential on the other. Okay, so when I say convenience-oriented stores, it, uh, you know, I'm really talking a, a lot more about fulfillment, distribution, collection of digital orders, okay? Now, uh, on the other hand, experiential stores are designed around a very immersive discovery and information-oriented, uh, you know, typically multi-sensory kind of experience to be expected. And those are set up to build brand affinity. So like I've mentioned earlier on that quite a number of uh, global brands, uh, they have open experiential flagships in major cities um, and, and they all have been quite mind-blowing. Consumers are very excited to visit them. Um, and of course, the AR, VR stuff and all that, you know, happens very much in those stalls as well. So one other thing I wanted to kind of point out that, you know, all of these experiential stalls, they don't necessarily have to be based on a permanent site also. So it doesn't mean that you need to have a permanent location. Okay, we've again seen brands having pop-ups. You know, uh, those are increasingly appearing in very urban uh, spaces, um, maybe not even designated for retail to begin with. You know, it could be a park, a garden, a town square, uh, or even car parks as well. So the concept is changing. You know, nothing is fixed at the moment. Um, it's really you know, who you see you're serving and, wh and where is the best location, the best environment to bring about these experiences. Um, so, I, I, I mean, in short, to, to me, it's, there's, there's, there's a lot of rooms for innovation for retailers. But the point here is that you've got to rethink, you've got to reimagine the roles of physical stores. Um, I still feel, you know, in the spirit of building brand relationship, um, we should go outside of the box to heighten that experience in store. You know, you can do sampling, you can co-create with your, your consumers, uh, you can add on gamification, you know, whatever that it takes 
to drive advocacy, to drive conversion. Yep. So how will the vibrant scene of digital commerce channels impact consumers shopping journey? Mm, okay, so first of all, um, we must recognize that shoppers are channel agnostic moving forward. Um, and, and because it is getting so much more complicated than before, um, it really calls for deep understanding of the new shopper journey. So a lot of clients have come to us to kind of re-understand uh, the entire uh, journey path of their consumers. The, as I mentioned earlier on, the traditional journey of plan, search and buy are no longer as straightforward as before. Um, you almost kind of need to reboot or refresh your understanding of the shopper journey of your customers. Now, a big part of this understanding, um, it's not just about what touch points to target, but also about what to anticipate, um, how to influence, how to develop similar and personalized ecosystem across the touch points and channels. So, yeah, um, I mean, unfortunately, uh, we we will have to take this opportunity to kind of re-understand our consumers and then reach out according to what will fit most in today's context and moving forward. And with these converging channels and touch points and the changing consumer shopping journey, um, the good part is that business will have a bigger reach to consumers. Um, on the other hand, it can be challenging for them to control consumer engagement mm -hmm. and all these different touch points. Do you, do you agree with that? Uh, yes, <laughs> touch points are expanding the reach of our marketers. So many of them actually find themselves in a situation where they feel they cannot control what they do. They also cannot control 100% of their content anymore. So if you think about it, it can be inspiring and exciting on one hand, but on the other hand, it can also be quite a scary place to be in also. So in this context, uh, I often had to remind uh, you know, our clients, retailers, and those who are running businesses to, to, to let go of the control freak side of us, you know, that, because uh, in the past, many things is maybe single channel, um, totally predictable, you know, so it, it really allows us to be able to control many aspects of the channel um, and the supply chains pretty well. Uh, but, but we have to let go of that a little bit, yeah. Um, in an increasingly data-driven environment. Um, I also feel that a lot of businesses tend to be very blindsided by technology and numbers, and they lose sight of the people, the people that who's, who's buying their products and services. You know, so you may have innovations such as voice assistant, chatbots and all that, right? They're very convenient, they're very efficient, no, no doubt about that. Um, but they also don't involve humans. So, you know, we've seen people telling us that, you know, the take up isn't that great because it's very depersonalized, right? So I, I, I guess my point is here, maybe two. One is um, just remember it is ultimately a person who explores your options, you know, who use your platforms, who experience your service. So our strong belief is that, you know, even as you maneuver or you change or you alter your channel strategy, human experience must be still at the core, okay, if not more important than before. Um, the, while consumers explore new channels, they can sometimes get uncomfortable, they may be confused, they may be dissatisfied. So this is, again, back to if you've done your homework well, okay, to deeply understand the human experience, you know, then you will do a much better job in terms of revisiting your overall channel strategy across multiple dimensions. Exactly on the point, I echo what you said. Uh, when it comes to commerce, it's not just transactional, but also very relational. Um, when it comes to digital commerce, then keeping this commerce relational can be especially valuable. At the same time, it can be challenging because you are mm -hmm. not facing your consumer face to face. Um, and you know, what would be your top three advices for businesses then to establish this kind of relationship with customers and deliver that personal touch in the digital commerce space? Okay. Um, I guess my overarching point here is that e-commerce must evolve. Okay. We already know moving forward, in-store shopping is becoming more purposeful, uh, maybe less leisurely, at least in the, in the short run. But if e-commerce is to take the center stage in the new retail world, there is some work to be done. Um, we, we see many cases, e-commerce is often still rooted in its very transactional design, you know, making it unable to fulfill um, 
the broader role of what customers or consumers are looking for. So it has to evolve to offer more of an experience, like I mentioned earlier on, to be able to optimize for browsing, discovering the brands and products. Um, maybe I'll leave uh, four, not three, key strategies here uh, as a final takeaway for everyone. Um, the first point, it's really about understanding how uh, consumer experience is evolving. Okay, every category will have different speed and intensity of change. So um, as a marketer yourself, you've got to understand what are the needs, motivations and touch points of the consumers and, and whether your brand has actually delivered consistently from start to end. So think about how we win across journeys, yeah? not just the end point of conversion, but how do we win at every juncture of the journeys. So that's one. Um, the second one, uh, which I mentioned quite a bit, is really about innovation. There is, you really have no choice but to start rethinking about how to create new experiences to your customers. Your co competitor setting has changed. So you got to add, you know, some excitement. You got to add some new solutions, new offers. Is it a new? Um, direct to consumer model, do you have compelling subscription or maybe digital apps to engage your uh, with your consumers? So innovation in short. Um, the third point, it's about communication. Okay, um, you may have the best experience, but how do you create that emotional connection and personalization uh, to meet your shopper's specific profile? So also make sure you understand your uh, your shoppers' profiles, whether they have changed, uh, especially in the last two years, um, you know, do you have new profiles, new segments uh, to reach out to? And how do you activate the various touch points? Um, and very importantly to me, it's leveraging influencers in digital channels as well. Okay. Uh, well, the last point will be easy. It is about activation, right? You know, um, with all of these uh, efforts being made to, to kind of revamp your, your channel strategy, how do I optimize overall navigation uh, and customer experience online? Okay. Um, there's, there's a lot more room for innovation to, uh, offline, but sometimes when it comes to online, again, back to what I've mentioned earlier on, uh, a lot of the websites are still very much rooted in transactional design. So how do we build uh, that experience? How do we uh, build loyalty and advocacy further? Really activate through optimized engagement and conver conversation. So that will be my last four points. Excellent. Do we have any other final thoughts you would like to share with the audience here? Um, no, I guess, uh, you know, online is here to stay. So we will have to get it right, you know, by ensuring our, our websites are presenting organizing and informing consumers of the products, right? Um, but it's also about relevancy and engaging because there are so many choices uh, out there that I can reach out to and remember all the various commerces as well. Um, so we do need to make sure that the approach is tailored to the consumer's mindset and nothing beats anything more than your understanding of what is best, whether it's in-store or online for your uh, consumers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. I believe the journey of retail evolvement has just begun as we discussed. And as consumer needs actually continue to evolve and with more technology breakthroughs, more commerce models probably would emerge. But uh, what yep. you shared today, Melanie, right? Understanding consumer experiences, keeping the innovation coming, communicating very effectively through human touch and optimizing the activation part, all these will remain imperative in the long run. So thanks a lot, Melanie, for coming on to Lazada Insider and for the great sharing with us. Thank you. This is Lazada Insider. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure you click follow and subscribe so you don't miss our latest insights and expert interviews. Thanks again for joining us. Until next time, take care.